speaking truth to power. We like that phrase, don't we, friends? And I think we've, we've added it to our list of favorite Quaker sayings. We've adopted it. And I think that's because those four short words capture the essence of Quaker witness in the world. Speaking truth is to externally express an internally received insight. It's an outward faithfulness to a spiritually experienced truth. It comes from the heart, from a place of love. And saying it to power implies courage. Courage to say it to those who may not want to hear it and who are in a position to punish. Faithfulness and courage. And Quakers have a long history of speaking truth to power. But here's a question, friends. What if power doesn't listen? What if when we knock on that door of power, speak our truth, the door just closes in our face? Or power says to us, isn't it a good thing that I have allowed you space to say what you want? But you know, in the real world, it's not like that. Or as Noam Chomsky suggests, what if power already knows the truth? like knowing that it is destroying the very ecosystems that support life on Earth, but carries on anyway. What then? Do we keep knocking? Do we keep speaking our truth? Do we give up? Or do we find another way? I'd like to offer an image comes with a warning. It, it's a challenging image. It challenges a property-conscious, law-respecting view of life. It challenges our values. In fact, it's an image that turns everything up, upside down. Let's personalize power. And I mean the sort of power that is top-down, dominating, my will over yours, controlling type of power. And let's imagine that form of power as a strong man. And imagine we are called to break into this strong man's house, tie him up and take away his possessions. Imagine that's what our witness in the world is about. Actually, it's not my image. It comes from Jesus. Mark chapter 3, 27 to 28. There's Jesus in the margins of the country in the rural north of Galilee, attracting followers, building his movement. And he's in the synagogue at Capernaum, the regional center of power. And he's preaching, teaching, and healing to the crowd, knowing that the center of power has got word of this movement and has sent agents to watch him, to follow him. And they confront him and accuse him of breaking the law having an evil spirit. By the prince of demons, he's casting out those demons. And here's what Jesus said. How can Satan cast out Satan? In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. 
then he can rob his house. Let's think about this idea of breaking in. Could it be that Jesus was suggesting that he was the one breaking in to human affairs, tying up the strong man, or Satan in the language of the day, and releasing all that he had hoarded, power over humanity, perhaps? What does seem clear is that Jesus was tying up those priests and scribes in their own logic and releasing their power back to the people. So, the strong one is the power that divides us and rules us, dehumanizes, abuses, and damages us in all the ways that we encounter in our work for justice and peace. The strong one takes us away from God. We are part of it, it is part of us, and it multiplies through us, unless we stop it. Our struggle is to get free, turn the tide, and change the power. Yesterday, we heard from George Lakey about being broken and how God enters into our brokenness and with the angelic presence of others transforms us. And I was very moved and related that to my own experience. And I know that's true of others. When we sit in worship We prepare ourselves. We center down and try to allow the spirit to break into us. We metaphorically pull back our curtains, open our doors, and invite the spirit in. We're trying to give up control. Inviting in God to disable and restrain the strong one in us and liberate whatever we possess for God's service. And if we're serious about following those leadings of love and truth that we witness and experience in worship, we will inevitably find ourselves in conflict with the world as it is, the strong one. Friends, restraining a violent person is a non-violent act of love. It does not harm. If the strong one is a symbol for the human domination system of power, greed, and violence, shouldn't our work be to do with restraining that? Speaking truth to power creates an opening for the spirit to break into the world. But if power refuses that opportunity, aren't we, as agents of God, required to break in and liberate what is held in that house? So what's all this got to do with today's theme, head? Well, I think it's about being smart. We're very good at being gentle as doves. This is about being wise as serpents. If we knock on the door of power and say, we want to come in, tie you up and nick your stuff, it's not going to work. We need to do some research and surveillance. We need to analyze where the strong one's power comes from and then find ways in which we can be effective in binding, restraining and taking it away. And there's hundreds of tools out there that can help us. And we can make our own up. I'd like to share a couple of tools that we use in turning the tide workshops. First, imagine we are a local Quaker meeting, one of the bigger ones, 
And we've just heard about a planning application for test drilling for fracking in our neighborhood. And we want to do something about that. So the first tool we call the pillars of power. And we start with a horizontal line there. That represents the ground. And then we draw a triangle, upside down triangle. Actually, it's a pyramid. And one thing we know about pyramids is they can't sit on their point. It goes against natural law. So they have to be propped up. So that represents our problem and the injustice. So our problem is fracking in our neighborhood. And we're saying, and through our experience, that goes against natural climate justice. It throws the balance of the ecosystem ultimately out. So it has to be propped up. So the analysis starts with, well, what's propping that up? And we can look at ideas of that. We, many props, as you like, corporate power and muscle, the weakness of local authorities in the face of that, lack of meaningful information for the public, things done behind closed doors, lack of civil society access to decision making. And you can have as many problems, throw all the, all the things in there that we like, all the reasons for that situation pertaining. And then we realize, well, we can't do all of that. We can't actually address and engage with all of that. So what we do is just pick one that we think we could. And let's say that we're going to take the lack of civil society access to decision making. That's the pillar we want to try to knock away. So we take it down a level and do the same thing. The horizontal line, the ground, the upturned pyramid. And this time, it's that pillar, that prop. Lack of civil society access to decision making. And so we look at the, what's propping that up. And we can come up with ideas. Uh, lack of public knowledge. We might say, OK, lack of people don't know about this. Let's do some direct action and go to that test site and sit in the trees or dig tunnels and stop the things happening. That'll get, gain attention and that'll attract attention. Or we might say, well, lack of transparency in decision making. We don't know what's going on in our local authority, what's happening there. And we could take this down another layer and as many times as we like, but let's just say that's what we're going to work on. So then we can decide how we go about that. And here's some ideas. Uh, we could have a workshop. We can invite people in who've been through that process. We can learn from them. We can invite local authority people in to tell us how the system works and all of those other ideas. And we may find that once we start this work, we're going to need to link with others. We may need the support of others. And we need to know, too, who are those involved in the issue likely to oppose us. So here's the other tool. We call it the social speedometer. And there's our campaign. We are frack-free local town. And our campaign is to increase the transparency of local decision-making. See how we turned it round into a positive. So the problem was lack of transparency. So we're not, you know, anti this and anti that. Let's make it increase transparency for local decision-making. Who can argue with that? Um, so there's the baseline of our speedometer. And as in a car, actually, it's a solar-powered car, <laughs> powered by the light. And on the left-hand side is zero miles an hour on the horizontal. And on the right-hand side is 100 miles an hour. So we put in the halfway point, 50, 25, let's say, and 75. And that's a way of mapping out all of the players in this issue. 
So the zero miles an hour, they're going nowhere with our campaign. They're very unsympathetic. Um, the ones that are not really going too fast are unsympathetic, neutral, and then the 100 miles an hour, that's us. We're full on with it. And what we can do then is think of all the people involved in who sit in those places. And there's some ideas. And, and with those sorts of that mapping, we can then make choices about where our focus might be for our efforts in order to be most effective. We might, for example, focus on the unsympathetic grouping and try and engage with them and argue with them and put the case to try and shift them slightly towards where we are, thereby leaving the very unsympathetic more exposed and stranded. Or we may say, let's look at the neutral people, and there may be some public figures, and if they offer a public comment of support, even marginally, that, that may magnify the impact. Or we could decide to build our movement, to build our allies, and connect with the obvious sympathetic ones. So we've got some choices in how we start, and we can revisit this along the life of the work. And those two tools are consistent favorites in Turning the Tide workshops with groups we've worked with. And the groups in Kenya really seized upon them. I want to close by telling you about Margi. There's Margie, in, uh, I don't know if you can see it. She's on the, on the left of the picture there, crouching down with the pen at the flip chart. And that's her group that she was training with her, from her community. When we moved that training on the next year to another part of the country, Margie joined us, joined the facilitation team as part of our rolling skilling up process. And I'm convinced this was the moment that the whole project took root. Margie said to the group, this time last year, I was sitting where you were. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what it was about. But I completed the training. And here's what I've done since. And she then went on to describe a couple of amazingly successful campaigns that she and her small Turning the Tide group had done in their community. First, they heard that there are a lot of local subsistence farmers that were being individually harassed by the bank who was calling in recent loans. And this was the reneging on the original agreement to pay the loan back over a period of years. And the farmers and their families were very frightened they'd lose their homes and their plots of land. Margie's group brought them together and used those tools to plan collective action. They mobilized, lobbied, and negotiated between the bank and the farmers. Long story short, the original agreement was restored. And then they heard of a local bursary allocation committee that was handing out education grants to favored students and not to the students that really needed it. Margie's group brought the students together and supported them to oppose it. They organized a nonviolent sit down outside the local council offices uh, and this attracted a heavy police presence. It was very intimidated, intimidating. But they refused to move until the uh, chair of the bursary committee came out to them. And when he eventually did, they agreed a meeting and the students put their case. The chair promised to investigate and guess what? Payments were made to the students that needed the money. Now, I was sitting next to Margie as she described those tools. 
and how she'd used them in those examples. And I could see the effect she was having on the group. It was electric. I saw jaws dropping, eyes opening, and you know, she did this in only a year with only two or three others. They were hugely inspired. And they went on to achieve some stunning campaign successes themselves in their own neighborhoods. And so it went on, each group inspiring the next and empowering the next, binding the strong one where they found it in their communities and in their lives. And we can do that, friends. We can and do share our stories inspire and embolden each other. We can be more effective if we're smart enough, if we use our heads as well as our hearts, hands and spirit. So friends, how ready are we to take on the strong one? How willing are we to be God's burglars?